Okay. So, um, so we had these two technical elements, and uh, yeah, we saw the proof in second seal up here. It's a really nice proof. It, it, you know, it's quite the way it's presented there. It's fairly dense. There's a lot going on, but it's really, really nice in seeing kind of all the different bits of the theory that we developed up to this point playing a role and kind of working together. There's Lagrange's theorem in there. There's uh, basic facts about divisibility, um, and then this whole notion of of of, of, of group actions and um, the mere existence of the C log P group subgroups. That's the first uh, C log theorem. That is all comes from the basic idea of the group acting on itself by conjugation, and we have the class equation from that. That was the key thing for the proof of the first C-log theorem. Then we are extending out that notion of a group acting on itself by conjugation to a group acting on its own subgroups through conjugation. So you conjugate a subgroup, you get another subgroup. Analyzing that, we're not quite going to build in a class equation for that. Um, no, because that's when a group is acting on itself. Here it's just a group acting on the system of subgroups, so it's not quite the same situation. There, there, there won't be necessarily a, a class equation. But, um, but again, this notion of, of, of a group acting on a set uh, involving the stabilizers, which here became the normalizers and so on. So was, was there any queries that you had about that uh, proof or any of the statements in it? It does become, become particularly dense and a little bit, you know, you have to follow it very carefully here when he starts. So, so we set up this, all the conjugates of a particular C log P subgroup, and then you introduce some other C log P subgroup Q, and the aim is to show it's one of these, and we do that by studying the, the, the action by conjugacy of this subgroup Q in this system of the subgroups. Um, and then it's a careful counting of uh, or, or a consideration of the number of things in each of the conjugacy classes under that action, in other words, in each of the orders. They all have to have size, the power of p, but they can't all be a genuine non-trivial power of p, because that would lead that would lead to this number of being divisible by p itself, but we already found uh, as an intermediate step that it wasn't divisible by p. Now, the third Seelov theorem finishes off the story. Um, so we now know that all Seelov P subgroups, they're all conjugate to one another. Okay, so any pair of them are related to other through conjugation. And the third, the third theorem gives us two pieces of information about the count of the number of distinct Seelov P subgroups of the bar. It's at, the two pieces of information is that it's con this number is congruent to one modulo P and also divides the order of G. I think in his proof here, he might go on to give a separate argument for the proof that it divides the order of G, but it's actually already here in the proof of the first theorem. Um, I don't quite, again, whether all these three theorems deserve to be three you know, separate standalone theorems is, is, is debatable. Maybe they should be kind of collapsed just into one result, but, um, but this is the, traditional nature that they stand as three theorem. And um, you can at this stage here, because he, he set up this set curly S of all the conjugates of one particular C of P subgroup. But of course at the end of this we now know that if you take all the conjugates of one particular C of P subgroup, you get them all, because they're all conjugate to one another. So this number K, this is all of the C of P subgroups of G. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, K. And then this number k featured in this factorization for the, the, the number of elements in G. So here we are, we see straight away that the, the count k of the number of C log P subgroups is a divisor of the of the order of the group. So that part is already dealt with. The, the, the only remaining part is to prove that it's congruent to one mod p. So we can look at, uh, at uh, the proof of that. Again, it's going to be an argument that builds on those uh, two technical lemmas. And in fact, be, given that we've already got the fact that K divides the order of G, 
that was all in that second half. So we only need this, we, we only need this first half here. Okay, so again, it starts off by considering the action on this system of CLOVS P subgroups, the action through conjugation. Um, And here, yeah, so here we take, we take this particular C log P subgroup P, and we consider the action of it on the system of C log P subgroups, okay? So we're not looking at the action of the whole group by conjugation of this system. Then it, it goes to these elements, they're all in the one orbit, because they're all conjugate to another. But we're looking at this restricted sub, so, so this subgroup of G, we're letting it act on this system. Okay, P happens to be one of the itself, one of the objects you're acting on. But we're just looking at conjugating each of these by all the elements in all the elements in P looking at the situation. Okay. Now On the proof of the second seal up here, the only P conjugate of P is itself. Yeah, because if you think of the action of P on itself by conjugation, well, when you're conjugating something, you're putting, you know, an element X, X, and X inverse on either side of the element. But if P is acting on this system, then if those elements X are coming from the subgroup P itself, so when you conjugate P by elements from P, the only thing you can get is P, okay? because it's a subgroup, it's closed under the operation. Okay? The order of the other conjugacy classes, the conjugacy classes of the other C log P subgroups. So we do expect something non-trivial to happen there when we conjugate those, P2 through PK, when we conjugate those by elements of P, we do expect, uh, you know, some non-trivial things to happen. And from the, from the second C log theorem, we know that the order of each of these is a power of P, okay? So that was the situation reached. Um, that was the situation here, where the group doing the action by conjugation the order of each of the congruency classes must be a divisor of that. So the order has to be some power of P. And each of the, when you consider the action by elements of P, by conjugation from these other ones, each of those other ones will be in a non-trivial orbit, okay? Because P2 will definitely be in its own orbit because it can be conjugated by the identity element. But then as soon as you take an element, not a non-identity element from P, you conjugate P2 by that non-identity element, that's going to send that C log P subgroup to another subgroup. Okay, it won't leave it fixed as the same subgroup. Okay. So all of the other, the, all of the, the conjugacy classes, the, the orbits of all of the other ones will be non-trivial. But the size of those orbits must be a power of P. So those are all a genuine non-trivial power of P. And as usual, the orbits will partition the set, okay? The original set has K things in it. So all of the cells of size, some non-trivial power of P, except for the, the singleton orbit. I mean, a singleton orbit is an orbit consisting of one element only. And that's, it's a singleton orbit that, that contains the uh, C log, the initial C log piece of group, capital P. So because it partitions it, everything is accounted or all K of these are counted for when you count up all the elements in all of the all of the orbits. So that the size of each orbit is a non-trivial power of P, and then there's one single orbit which contains only one element. So you're adding up 
a load of different powers p and then adding one. What's the congruence class of such a sum modulo p? Because what you're doing is you're doing well. You'll be summing the sizes of each of the orbits in this situation. It's some power of p plus some other power of p plus some other power of p. And all of these ai's are strictly bigger than one. They're all non zero, if they're all non trivial powers of p, but you strictly bigger than zero. They're non trivial powers of p. And then there's the final single orbit, the orbit which just consists of the c log p sub p. That's, that's this is the size of that one there. So what's the congruence class of that modulo the prime p? Well, the everything is divisible by p, and then you've got the matrix. Okay, so so this is congruent to one by p. So again, it's really like quite simple in some ways. The idea of just counting up the elements here in the set by acting on it with, with a certain group, splitting it into partition of orbits, and counting up the number of elements in each orbit and adding them together. And you get all different powers, well, various powers of P, but then there's, there's one particular orbit that only has one thing. Okay, so that gives you the congruence to one. At K, the number of C of P subgroups is congruent to one modulo P. The second half of the argument is just showing that K also divides the order G, but um, I think you missed the trick there in that we had already seen that uh, at this stage up here in this uh, factorization of the order of G up there. Okay. So is that okay? Is that any questions based on that? Now, it, it really is the kind of rarefied heights of, of, of the theory in this unit. It's the kind of culmination. It's, it's kind of drawing everything together. So groups, quotient, you know, along the way to get to this, we have to consider quotient groups, factor groups, homomorphisms, everything. And it glues it all together. Glues it all together in these quite, um, quite powerful results. And so the claim is that these results are quite powerful. Um, so it's, we better prove that. Oh, we better show some show some examples of that. Um, I'll flip. I wasn't record. I was just recording on the webcam for all of that. Okay. Anyway, I don't have the, I don't have the on the screen. But anyway. So to illustrate why, you know, give start to give some examples of why. This thing is you know, these theorems should be regarded as being powerful. Um, we'll have a look at have a look at this one. So there's there's example uh, fifteen point eleven, which it presents as an application of theorem fifteen point ten. But um, I'd like to so theorem fifteen point ten is is like a further application, you know, a, a further general result. But let's just consider this, this one special case of it. So a group of order 15. <clears throat> um, so the basic question is, is, you know, what kind of groups of order 15 can there be? Um, there might be many different groups of order 15. You might find you know, many different mathematical situations where you've got collections of elements and an operation between them. And there's 15 elements, and it's a closed system under the operation, and it satisfies the group axioms. Okay, but from from a group theory point of view, when when we're pondering the question, how many groups of size 15 are are there? We really mean how many different isomorphism classes, how many fundamentally different a uh, types of groups are there at modulo uh, of of size 15. The answer to that would be that there's that there's only one. Okay, so in fact, all groups, any any such group, any group of order fifteen. What we're going to argue for is that it's cyclic, and hence it's going to be you know, all cyclic groups 
of size 15, they're all isomorphic to Z15. Z15, the, the group of integers under addition modulo 15, that's our usual model. Usual model in, in written additively, an additive type model of a cyclic group is the integers modulo uh, whatever. Okay. These are the integers mod 15 under addition mod 15. But certainly cyclic, it's generated by one. One, one plus one, one plus one plus one, et cetera, all of this. Okay, now that's a pretty big claim because groups with 15 elements, think about all the different Cayley tables you might write down. You know, 15 elements is a lot to choose from. There's 15 squared entries in the Cayley table to fill in. Surely there's more than one significantly different group Cayley table you can generate, okay? Well, apparently there isn't, okay? So, so the proof of this is an application of application of the CLA. So. And we see the link with number theory because the whole thing turns on the prime factorization of 15. Okay? So the prime factorization of 15 is, of course, 5 by 3. So um, <clears throat> from the, well, from the first Seelove theorem, G, whatever this group is, G contains a subgroup of size 5. And a subgroup of size 3, okay? Because they are Seelove 5 subgroups and Seelove 3 subgroups, okay? Because 5 to the power 1 and 3 to the power 1, they're the largest powers of those primes dividing the size of the group. Okay? Now, the, the first CLOP theorem tells us that there is at least one subgroup of these, you know, at least one subgroup of size 5 and at least one subgroup of size 3. Uh, there might be multiple of them, okay? But by the third theorem, Third Seelov theorem. Well, I'm the second one. We're really using them all, all the time. Um, you know, all of the. I'll still use K for the. For yeah, you, all of the K Seelov five subgroups are um, conjugate to one another. Yeah. And the same thing can be said as all of the, I want to use the L for the number of them that there are, all of the L C love 3 subgroups, these are just subgroups of size 3 of G, uh, these are conjugate to one another as well. Okay. Now but the third theorem tells us that uh, K The third theorem gives you those two conditions on the number of number of subgroups have to run. So by the third theorem, uh, this number k divides 15, divides the order of the group, and k is also congruent to one modulo p. Also, when you apply it to the CLO3 subgroups, L, this number of them that there are, divides 15, and L is congruent to 1 modulo 3. Now, but those two conditions allow us to know exactly what K and L are, okay? Because, like, if, if K must divide 15, well, that's just a small number of possibilities. K can be 1, 3, 5 or 15, yeah? But K must also be congruent to 1 modulo 5. So which of those four possibilities, 1, 3, 5, and 15, which of them are congruent to 1 modulo 5? 1, 3, 5, and 15. Well, none of them except the first one, right? One, 
one is competent to one mod five. Yeah. And similarly, L L must be must divide fifteen as well. So L can be must be one of one, three, five, or fifteen. But it must also be congruent to one mod three. And the only one of those is one. Okay. So that implies that both K and L are are one. So not particularly that K equals L, but that they're both equal to one. So there's only one subgroup of size five. There's only one subgroup of size three. Okay. So let's say let let H and K be the subgroups. So let's say H is the one of size uh, size five, and K is the one of size three. Now, going back to the uh, oh, I wrote third, but I meant second. By the second, by the second C-log theorem, excuse me, all of the C-log P subgroups are conjugate to one another. So if you take any element from, from the group and you conjugate, say, the H, the, the one C-log 5 subgroup, if you conjugate H by G, just by the, by the operation of conjugation, that, that's a that's a subgroup of G, and it has the same number of elements as H. So this is a C log five subgroup. But we've just determined that there's only one C log five subgroup. So this must be equal to H. Yeah. There's no other C log five subgroups that it could be. It has to be itself. And the same thing when you conjugate the one of order three. All the CLOV3 subgroups are conjugate to one another. So this is going to be another CLOV3 conjugate and another CLOV3 subgroup, but there is only one. So that's equal to K. So that means, i.e., H and K are both normal in G. So we're slowly building up uh, a lot of information about G. G has one subgroup of order five, one subgroup of order three. They're both normal. Okay. Um, what we're gunning here for is, oh, first of all, um, five is a prime. So a group of size five is cyclic. Yeah. So uh, H is isomorphic to Z5. K is isomorphic to Z3. Okay, these are groups of prime order. So they're cyclic and there's, there's only one possibility for the isomorphism classes. Um, now you can see what the temptation here is to say that the, our attention is drawn to the notion of direct products, internal direct products. We've got a subgroup of size five subgroup of size 3, the whole group is size 15, maybe the whole group is just isomorphic to the direct product of these two. And that is the case, okay? So we're drawn to, drawn to considering an internal direct product direct product of H and K. If we can do that, then we'll have a subgroup of size 15 in G, but G only has size 15, so that will, in fact must be all of G. Now, if you've got your text there, if you flip back to remind ourselves of, you can't just willy-nilly go taking subgroups and Taking internal direct products, of them. there are certain conditions that it that it that it that it has to satisfy, and so this was in the homomorphisms chapter. I believe. Go back to the contents. 
from the ice, isomorphisms or homomorphisms? Isomorphisms, Jeff. Take one, five, seven. Direct products. So external direct products, but we're interested in internal direct products, which is page 159. Internal direct product, which talks about H and K as well. Now, <clears throat> What this means is you can you can take an in, you can form an internal direct product of two groups, but in order to make it work, you need to know two things. Well, in order for it to be the direct, in order for it to give you the whole containing group G, it must be true that G can be written as the product of the two subgroups, meaning every element of G actually can be formed as something from H multiplied by something. Okay, that's yet to be seen. It must be the case that the two subgroups only intersect in the identity element, yeah? And also, it must be the case that the two groups are elements, elements from H commute with elements from K. Not saying that the whole group is commutative necessarily, but that if you take anything from H multiplied by anything from K, you can flip, you can flip that order. Okay. So we've got to check, check these various conditions. So now the first one to think about is the intersection. Consider H intersection K. So H is a cyclic subgroup of size five the subgroup of size size uh, three. But you see, the key thing here is the primeness of the size. In a cyclic subgroup of size five, what are the orders of the elements in in H? One and five. One and five. Yeah. The identity is size one has has order one. Every non-identity element in H, because by Lagrange's theorem, those elements will generate non-trivial subgroups. The sizes of subgroups have to divide by the size of the group. The subgroup, you've got size greater than one, so you must divide five, so you must be five, so you must be the whole group. So you must have order, that element must have order five. Same thing goes for, for three, okay? Non-identity elements in Z3 all have order three. So non-identity elements, non-identity elements in H have order five. Similarly for K, non-identity elements in K, K have order three. So what about an element that's in the intersection? There isn't any. Only the identity, exactly right. Because you can't have an element that simultaneously has order three and order five, because order is uniquely defined. Okay? So this implies that the only thing that is possibly in the intersection is the identity. And of course, the identity is there because these are subgroups. Every subgroup contains the identity. Okay. So that takes off that condition that we require to be true to, to do an internal direct product. The next uh, question to address, if we're thinking of doing an internal direct product, is do elements of H and K commute? Question mark. And we're just dealing with some abstract root G. We've no reason to think G is abelian. We have to consider the possibility that it's non abelian so this is the question, i.e., for a, a little h in h and a little k in k, this is the question, is hk equal to kh? I'll put a question mark. I'm not asserting that, I'm just asking the question. Now, I'm trying to think how I motivate this argument. Well, I mean, is it immediately obvious? Is, is h times k, little h times little k, is it equal to little k times little h? 
voxel group, so we thought we could roll it in the overall group. Yeah, so if you, if you take a pair of elements from H, multiply them as in H. If you take a pair of elements from K, multiply them as in K. Yeah. So here we're taking one from each. So they're both elements from the group G for sure. So it's certainly elements of the group G. But is it the same element of group G on both sides? Are they equal? Question mark. Um, it's not immediately obvious. I don't know. But what do, okay, H and K aren't any old subgroups. They're special subgroups that only intersect in the identity. They're each of them of prime order, so they're cyclic. One is order five, one is order three. But we've got to use a bit more information. They're sitting inside a group of size 15. And what we've seen from the application of the C log theorems is they're both normal subgroups, both normal in G. Now, norma once you know that, nor normality immediately is it. Normality is all to do with the notion of conjugation, if you like. Left cosets being equal to right cosets. But that's the same as, that's equivalent to the notion of conjugation. So how can I rephrase this question as something which involves conjugation? So I want to rephrase the question. So I want to take this condition here and mess around with it in a way that introduce conjugation. Now, if you want to see conjugation happening, you want to see elements and their inverses involved in products. So the thing to do here is to move the K and H to the other side. So I take this, so I'm going to leave this H and K here, and I'm going to take this K and H and move them to the other side. Now, how do you do that? You mean, it means we want to multiply both sides on the left by k inverse. That will cancel, that will get rid of that k. And multiply both sides on the right by h inverse. That will get rid of the h. It will cancel, delete the identity. So if I go k inverse, h, k, h inverse, and what's left on the right-hand side is, is, is e, the identity. Now, I'm not asserting this. I'm raising this as a look. That's a question, but it's an equivalent question to the first one. And this is the question is question of do the elements of H and K uh, commute? So the, that question, do elements of H and K commute? This is now this equivalent to this question. Is this combination K inverse H, K, H inverse equal to the identity? Now there's a there's 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 a lot of conjugation going on. In this product of four elements, you can see two different conjugates, can't you? Because if you look here, underlined in red here, is a conjugate of the element H by K inverse. And underlined in green over here is a conjugate of K by H. And we know that these subgroups we are considering are, are uh, normal. So these subgroups are closed under conjugation. Okay. So when, when, when we bracket it like this, when we bracket it like that, because it's a certain number of we're, we're in the groups, the operation is associated, we can bracket it no matter how you want. This is the conjugation of H by another group element, K inverse. But the subgroup H is normal. So this must be equal to some other H, let's call it a H1. Some other element of the group H1 by this particular element H inverse, which is still left here. And where is this element in the group G? Where can you say this? Now, when I say where, I mean, what possible answers are there? But, but the, the picture we've got of G is there's the group G, there's the subgroup H, there's the subgroup K. Is there anywhere you can locate this element? Well, it's, it's a product of two elements of H. So it's definitely an element of H. OK? 
Okay, that's that's for some H1 an element of H as H is normal. So H, the, the subgroup H is normal, so it's closed under conjugation. So if you conjugate an element from H by K, you're going to get some other element of H. So this uh, quadruple product of elements is definitely an element of H. But when you bracket, when you bracket it the other way, okay, what's this? This is HK, H inverse. This is the conjugation of an element from K by some other element from the group. Well, K is normal. So this we're looking at now, a K inverse times a K1. For some K1, an element of K, as K is normal. So this, this quadruple product, whatever it is, is in K. So now what do we know about the quadruple product? It's simultaneously in H and K. So it's in the intersection. So the quadruple product can only be the identity because we've already decided the intersection just consists of the identity. Okay. Aha. So this is equal to E. So I'm asserting this now, not just ask, posing the question is equal to E since the intersection of the two subgroups we've already decided is the trivial subgroup. It just consists of the just consists of the um, identity element. But this question about the quadruple product being the identity, this was equivalent to the statement that elements from H and K can be true. Okay. So elements from H and K commute with one another. They don't necessarily, you know, we're not saying two elements from H commute with each other, although they do because H is cyclic. So everything's just a power of the generator. So product of two powers of generators, two products, two powers of the same element will commute. But they commute with each other. So once you know that, once you've got two subgroups, which only uh, intersect in the identity element and two subgroups where elements commute, then, so there exists, there exists the internal direct product, direct product of H and K in G. Meaning, H times K is a subgroup, is a subgroup of G, and HK is isomorphic to the Cartes, the, the external direct product of the two groups. It's, it's, it's isomorphic to as a set, well, it's, it's, it's equal as a set, well, it's, it's, it's bijective as a set with the Cartesian product. Now, uh, what size has this got? How big is HK? Well, if, as a set, it's, it's bijected to the Cartesian product. There's five things in H, three things in K. So it's 15 things in the Cartesian product. So this is a subgroup of size 15 in G. But G only has 15 things in it. So, so HK is actually equal to G. So G, G is the internal direct product. If you got any two subgroups that only intersect in the identity and that whose elements commute with one another, then there's an internal direct product of those as a subgroup of the containing group. But now it must be all of the containing group because it's got the same size. So G is the internal direct product of H and K. So, what that means is G is isomorphic to the direct product of H and K. But H is a cyclic subgroup of order five. K is a cyclic subgroup of order three. 
what do we know about direct products of cyclic groups? They're cyclic when you, 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 it's not just any old two cyclic groups. A different prime order. So, so the general statement is Zn cross Zn is isomorphic to Z, the product, when M and N are co-prime. Okay, that's 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 the condition. Okay, so you can have like Z two cross Z four. It's not the same as Z eight. They're distinct groups. Z eight is cyclic. Z two cross Z four is not cyclic. But when the two indices, when the two sizes are co-prime to one another, then it is isomorphic to the to the cyclic group of that size. And five and three are certainly co-prime. So so that is isomorphic to, to Z. So that's 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 the conclusion. We we started out with a general group G of size 15. And we've now decided that it has to be isomorphic to Z15, cyclic. And it's isomorphic to Z15. Every cyclic group of size 15 is, is, is isomorphic to Z15. Because the only, uh, uh, you know, a, cyc a cyclic group, the isomorphism class of the cyclic group is determined by its size. So we've immediately, what started out the question of, you know, how many different isomorphism classes are there for groups of size 15? We might have been expecting a whole diverse range of different, substantially different groups of size 15. Because thinking of thinking of the Cayley tables, they've got 15 elements down one side, 15 elements across the top. There's a huge number of internal entries, 15 squared, whatever that is, quite a few hundred. Um, so surely there's a huge range of possibilities of completing that Cayley table in a group type way. Actually, there's only one way, essentially. Maybe, yeah, there's, there's the way that it works for Z15, and then maybe every other way is just kind of changing the order of the elements and, and doing the same operation in the rows and columns. But so essentially, essentially there's only one way. Every two possible behavior tables are going to be isomorphic. Okay. So that shows you like the great, uh, the great combined power of these C, C log theorems. All we started off with was a knowledge about how many elements were in the group. And now suddenly we determined those isomorphism class, which is, which is quite simple. Because the general question, if, you go, if you're facing a group of a general typical size with lots of prime factors, and those primes raised to various powers, in general there'll be a large number of you know, possible groups of, of that size. But in certain special instances, when we know certain things about the prime factorization of the size of the group, with the help of the Seelock theorems, we can boil down the possibilities a lot because we can identify what the Seelock subgroups are. We can pick out when some of them are normal. And then when some of them are normal, it allows you to perform factor groups so you can reduce the size and then try and classify that smaller group and so on. Or in this case, we can actually show it to be an, uh, an internal direct product and hence isomorphic to this one group. Okay, okay so that, uh, any other, there any queries about that, questions? Okay, so um, on Friday, I think we'll do a bit more of this, looking at a few more uh, consequences of the C log theorems. And, and then from next week on, I think we'll, 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 we'll start to hammer away at lots of the other exercises in, in, in the book and uh, get a lot of practice on this. Okay. And I'll be releasing the mock exams as well. Hopefully, I have those ready for next week.